Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the unsolved murder of Mary Rogers, a death of a beautiful young woman that is still unsolved to this day. It became one of those stories that was sensationalized by the newspapers and even got the interest of Edgar Allan Poe. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. Mary Rogers was probably born in 1820 in Lyme, Connecticut, though her birth records have been destroyed. She was a beautiful young woman who grew up as the only child of her widowed mother. At the age of 20, Mary lived in the boarding house that was run by her mother. Although it was her amazing beauty that made her the talk of the neighborhood. Wish I could say that. <laughs> you become the talk of the neighborhood because you're pretty. You're gorgeous. You're stunning. Her father, James Rogers, died in a steamboat explosion when she was 17, and she took a job as a clerk in a tobacco shop owned by John Anderson in New York City. Anderson paid her a generous wage, in part because her physical attractiveness brought in customers. A customer wrote that he spent an entire afternoon at the store only to exchange teasing glances with her. Another admirer published a poem in the New York Herald referring to her heaven-like smile and her star-like eyes. Jeez. Some of her customers included notable literary figures such as James Fenmore Cooper, Washington Irving, and Fitz Green Halleck. On October 5th, 1938, the newspaper The Sun reported that Miss Mary Cecilia Rogers had disappeared from her home. Her mother, Phoebe, said she found a suicide note which the local coroner analyzed and said revealed a fixed and unalterable determination to destroy herself. Very deep way to say it. The next day, however, the Times and Commercial Intelligence reported that the disappearance was a hoax and that Rogers was just visiting a friend in Brooklyn. The Sun had previously published a story known as the Great Moon Hoax in 1835, causing controversy. Some suggested this return was actually the hoax, evidenced by Roger's failure to return to work immediately. When she finally resumed working at the tobacco shop, one newspaper suggested the whole event was a publicity stunt managed by her boss, Anderson. Stunt or not, it was not long after that Mary departed from her position at Anderson's, returning home to help her mother at the boarding house. While her life was more private at the boarding house, that did not stop from men courting her and being like, hey baby. <laughs> Although Mary had several admirers among her mother's lodgers, she soon turned her attention to Daniel Payne, a cork cutter and boarder who became her fiance sometime in the summer of 1841. As fate would have it, Daniel was the last person to see Mary alive. On the morning of July 25th, 1841, Mary left the Rogers boarding house, saying that she was going to visit an aunt uptown. What happened after that, as the hours turned into days, is unknown. At the time, some said that she had just run away, perhaps in another attempt to garner attention. Payne, however, did not feel the same way about his fiance because of the gangs of robbers and rapists that were talked about in the penny papers. After two days of searching and growing more worried that she may have been kidnapped, he set out a missing persons report. The post caught the eye of Arthur Cromelian, the ex-boyfriend of Mary and a former boarder at her mother's house. Cromelian took his search across the ferry to Hoboken, arriving just in time to witness the recovery of Mary's body from the Hudson River and to identify the corpse. After police questioning, and once the authorities were convinced that he was not involved with um, Mary's death, police turned to their top suspect, her fiancé Daniel. Not only was Daniel the last person to see Mary alive, but rumors started circulating that they had fought before she vanished and that she threatened to call off the marriage, giving him reason to, you know, kill her. After, after Daniel produced an alibi, however, solid leads um, disappeared. 
Meanwhile, papers across New York and New England took up a running color commentary in Ellicottville, New York. One reporter lamented the southerly manner in which the coroner at Hoboken performs his duties. While outside Philadelphia, other papers wondered if the death had been a suicide. Even New York Governor William H. Seward got involved, announcing in several New York papers a $750 reward for information to solve the case. In early September, there seemed to be a break in the case. A group of local boys playing in a field not far from Sibyl's cave came across the bundles of bloody clothing strewn about some bushes. After their discovery in what came to be known as the murder thicket, their mother, Fenrika Loss, who operated the nearby Nick Moore House Pub, alerted the police. The police questioned Loss, whose account was published in the New York Herald. According to Loss, Mary had checked into the Nick Moore House on the faithful night with an unknown man. The pair had gone out and never returned. Loss claimed that she didn't think too much of it at the time, but remembered hearing screams coming from the woods later that night. Although it seemed quite suspicious that she had never shared these details until now, the police were satisfied and just left. They're like, thanks, dude. Less than a month later, on October 7th, Daniel Payne made his pilgrimage to the murder thicket, followed by a drinking binge across Hoboken. During the night, he bought and drank a bottle of Landium, overdosing on a bench outside Seville's cave. Pedestrians found his body only a few hundred yards from where Mary's body had been discovered. A note found next to Daniel read, To the world, here I am on the spot. God forgive me for my misfortune and my misspent time. Without easy answers, the press once again imagined their own version of events. As an early working woman in an urban center, Mary became a kind of symbol. Her name a shorthand for the heiress problems and a warning to parents to protect their daughters and the disasters that may befall them. Many papers, many papers even claimed, without evidence, that she was a prostitute. The New York public may have been satisfied with that answer, but not everyone was. Edgar Allan Poe himself was not. A former New Yorker, he remembered Mary Rogers from her first disappearance in 1838. As the news of her ultimate fate reached him, he became fixated and followed every detail. In November 1842, over a year after Mary's death, Poe published the first part of The Mystery of Mary Roget, his second detective novel and sequel to Murders of the Rue Morgue. Transporting the crime and characters to Paris, Poe changed the names but kept the basic details the same. He was so confident in his deductive skills he even claimed to have solved the real-life case in the story's introduction. All argument founded upon the fiction is applicable to the truth, and the investigation of the truth was the object. Though his story was popular with the public, the police wrote off Poe's theories. Despite promising to solve the crime, Poe wasn't very clear about the identity of the killer, never naming a specific person. And the same month, another untimely death brought authorities a new possibility. On November 6th, 1842, Frederica Loss was accidentally shot by one of her sons. She spent the next 10 days dying in agony, babbling incoherently in a string of broken English and German. Hallucinating, she claimed that the spirit of a young woman was tormenting her, and that she made her final confession. As the New York Tribune reported it, Mary had, in fact, come to Hoboken, in company of a young physician who undertook to procure for her a premature delivery which in simple terms is an abortion. Mary had died during the operation, after which Loss's sons had dumped the body in the water and scattered the clothes to avoid suspicion. In later years, some would suspect that Loss was working as an assistant to the notorious Hoboken abortionist, Madame Costello. Following their mother's death, the two eldest Loss boys were briefly charged in connection with Roger's murder implicated, at least, in illegal disposal of a body. The lack of hard evidence, other witnesses, and Miss Loss's condition during her confession were too much for the court to take, and the case against them was quickly dismissed. Before long, the police and public gave up looking. In 1881, John Anderson died in Paris after years of increasing instability and claims that the ghost of Mary Rogers haunted him. The reasons for Anderson's guilt, if indeed there were any, were unclear. But even if Mary's spirit didn't really stalk him, the unsolved crime and public speculations 
created an infamous association he was never able to shake. As Daniel Stashover noted in his book, The Beautiful Cigar Girl, not only did Anderson claim that Mary's ghost visited him, he also blamed his employee's fate for his failure to cross over from business into New York politics. Later, a strange detail came out in the legal battle over Anderson's fortune, a years-long court case where the long-dead Rogers was resurrected more than once. In 1887, the New York Times coverage quoted one counselor's suggestion that John Anderson gave Poe $5,000 to write the story of Mary Rose in order to draw people's attention from himself, who many believed was her murderer. Whether Anderson's offer was made or accepted, we may never know, but the suggestion casts a lingering suspicion. It's just one of the many uncomfortable questions in a mystery that refuses to rest. The mystery of Mary Rogers was left to history and fiction. To this day, the case remains unsolved. To conclude, I really wish I could figure out who murdered this girl. Like, there's not a lot of evidence. She basically disappeared and was found three days later. They don't know who killed her. They never even described how she officially died. Um, and if there was, I didn't find it. <laughs> and she was known as the beautiful cigar girl. Like, everyone came to the to the tobacco shop just to look at her. She was one of those. And when she died, everyone's like, oh my god! If she was ugly, they would not have treated it this way. They would have not cared. They might not have even done an article about it. She did. Oh, who cares? Ooh. Because she was pretty, though, she got all the attention, alive and dead. And her fiancé killed himself because basically he couldn't live without her. He died near where she was found and just couldn't handle it, which I find really sad. And maybe it was her boss that killed her. Maybe it was someone else entirely. Maybe it was just some random guy on the street. I don't know. Maybe she did get an abortion. I, You know, there, there's a ton of things that could have happened here. And, of course, because this case is so old, there's a possibility that we're never going to find out what happened to her. I mean, even Edgar Allan Poe was interested in the case, but he never, like, said who he thought did it. Um, He never named a suspect, so, of course. If he did figure out who it was, he didn't say. I bet he didn't. But maybe one day we'll figure out who carry, who killed Mary Rogers. Until then, we'll just have to deal with the fact that people gave up on her, which is so sad that after, you know, a year or two, when the answers started to run out, they just gave up. They didn't look into anyone else. They didn't try and find more evidence or do anything else. They just left her to rot. Rude. All I'm saying. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, we'll see you later.